The game is Pokemon Run and Bun. This is a mod of Pokemon Emerald that implements Pokemon and mechanics up to and including Generation 8. More importantly though, Run and Bun was designed to be extremely challenging when played with hardcore Nuzlocke rules. The modder Dexa spent about two years refining and balancing the game to make it one of the hardest ROM hacks ever made. Dexa is a very experienced Pokemon player both in competitive singles and in challenge running so he really knows his stuff. I could tell you about how every gym leader in this game has a legendary, how double battles are designed with extremely devious mechanics in mind, or how every trainer from the very start has basically perfect type coverage on their Pokemon. The only thing I really have to say though is that this game has been out for a few months now and every professional and semi-professional Nuzlocke runner has been grinding it, yet only two people have gotten a confirmed win under hardcore Nuzlocke rules. If you consider how much the community's knowledge and skill has grown over the years, this is the only thing you need to know to definitely say that this game is harder than Emerald Kaizo, the legendary ROM hack that took me, one of the best Nuzlockers in the world, 151 attempts to beat. So join me at the start of my journey to become the third person to beat this game. Speaking of beating something, you know, I talk a lot about genitals on my channel, and today's sponsor is again Manscaped, but today they go straight from your balls into your face. <laughs> they're making a beard, they're doing a beard thing, okay? It's a, look, it's a beard, it's a beard grooming set. They finally got something for, and goddamn do I need it. What the hell is going on here? The Beard Hedger Pro Kit is everything you need to make a great beer. If you want a five o'clock shadow, if you want a full beer, if you want whatever the hell this is, you can have it all. Let me walk you through what's in this kit, okay? Number one, numero uno, numero eins, the Beard Hedger. That's right, that's its name. And you know what it does? It hedges your beard. It's great. This thing has a powerful 7200 rpm motor that's 7200 times per minute it's got it's got a little wheel with settings on it and you can just set it to whatever you want it's waterproof it's cordless charges via USB C. like there's a beard oil beard shampoo to get your beard washed to put that one in your shower there's the beard conditioner as well you can also put in your shower and finally there's the legendary Sorry, the smoke detector in my apartment just went off because of how fire the deal is you can get. Anyway, there's a beard balm, which I can only assume is a yummy snack. They even put scissors in here. Let's be serious for a second. If you'd like to take your beard game to the next level, go to manscaped.com slash Pokemon challenges. Let's get back into the video, guys. I grab my starter Piplup, level it up to the first level cap of 12, and start my journey. Even these early battles give you a pretty good sense of just how nasty this game is going to be. This route includes a team with a full fire water grass core, and another with a couple of extremely annoying metronome users. And then there's the boss, this very angry Aqua Grunt, who just wants you to get out of his way. Unlike early game trainers in vanilla Pokemon games, this guy has good Pokemon with good items, strong abilities, and good synergy with each other. His lead Carvana has the rough skin ability to punish you for using the exact strategy I was relying on, Fake out. He has an execute with a supremely annoying moveset, confusion and bullet seed for damage, stun spore to spread paralysis, and leech seed for healing. Combine that with an Oran berry and its harvest ability to bring back its berries, and this execute can heal up on you forever if you're not careful. And then there's his ace, Krogunk. Here, you see the kind of planning you never see from enemy trainers in standard Pokemon games, especially this early on. This Krogunk is holding a Salak Berry, which increases speed when the holder drops below one quarter health. It also knows the move Belch, one of the most powerful poison moves in the game. Despite its power, you don't see it often because it comes with an unfortunate condition. You can't use Belch unless you've already eaten a berry in battle, but this Krogunk came prepared. If I'm not careful, Krogunk can munch on its berry, get faster than everything I have, and sweep with massive Belches. You can see how difficult this fight could be, even if you weren't playing by hardcore Nuzlocke rules. But naturally, I'm making it even harder on myself. I can only catch the first Pokemon I encounter on each route, and if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever. So I have to build a team that can take on this menace from the few locations I've been able to visit so far. Thankfully, I was well prepared for this fight. Houndor is a pretty solid early game encounter. Dark and Fire types combine to make a really powerful and versatile offensive Pokemon. And because this game is playing off Generation 8's mechanics, it therefore has the physical special split. But the reason it's a secret weapon for this battle has nothing to do with damage and everything to do with its ability on Nerve. This Aqua Grunt strategy largely revolves around eating berries, and with a Nerve, Houndor shuts him down completely. My team of Poochyana, not to execute Krogunk, Piplup, Beedrill, and Houndor made it through the first boss without much issue, but the difficulty ramps up pretty quickly. The boss of the next area features the first set of fights with no healing allowed in between, a pair of Aqua Grunts at the Slateport Museum. The first team is designed to chip away at you. The Murkrow has Nightshade and Payback, the Skrelp has Toxic Protect and Black Sludge for healing if you can't take it out quickly. Finally, the Tortuga has a Rindo Berry and Solid Rock to ensure it can live even a 4x super effective grass moves and get a chance at a run-ending set of Ancient Power Boosts. 
The next team is fully ready to pounce if you've been weakened by the previous fight. All three Pokemon have a move that deals double damage if you've been poisoned. The Marini has Baneful Bunker, Soak to turn your poison types into water types that can be poisoned, and Toxic to further disrupt. The Frillish Cursed Body can destroy your attempts to sweep by disabling an attack at the worst possible time. If you can't two-shot Frillish, it just recovers all the way through. Remember Hardcore Nuzlocke rules means I can't use any items in battle, which this game doesn't allow you to do anyway, so healing the poison in battle is pretty tricky. But the scariest Pokemon here is definitely the Whirlipede thanks to its speed boost ability. It probably isn't one-shotting your whole team by itself. After the other five Pokemon across these two battles have chipped away and spread poison across your team though, one speed boost might be all it needs to end a run. With a game like this, it's all about finding the value in every single encounter. This fight is a great example. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Pancham is a great Pokemon, or that I was excited to see it as my encounter when I picked it up on my way to this boss fight, but here, its feint attack is my best option against the Frillish, a clean two-hit knockout. With Mold Breaker, I don't even have to worry about Cursed Body. Even with a pretty strong team, this fight almost spiraled out of control. The Whirlipede got its speed boost, and its rollout just kept connecting into my poor Fanpy. And when I say poor Fanpy, I mean it. This Fanpy might just be the most garbage Pokemon I've ever caught in a Nuzlocke. Jesus in Christ. It's a shame too, because as a bulky ground type, Donphan is usually one of the most valuable Pokemon in a Nuzlocke. If it had even a tiny bit more attack, this fight would have been an easy win, and I would have been through the first two bosses of this game without a single death. Instead, I'm staring down this Whirlipede that's about to throw out a max power rollout, and now I have a very tough decision to make. Fanpy has done one thing right. Its cute charm has attracted the Whirlipede, but because of its utter trash attack IV, Ice Shard doesn't KO from this position. I'll need a critical hit, an attract, or a rollout miss to get through Deathless a 58% chance in combination. Part of team building for fights like this is knowing what's expendable. Part of why I brought Pancham in the first place was because I don't need it down the line. I have another fighting type and another dark type in my box. I should switch. This would end the rollout and allow me to revenge kill after the sacrifice, but I really want to get through this fight deathless. And this fan pee is really shitty. I let it rock. I mean, it is what it is, right? You kind of got to go for those, man. Sometimes you just got to fucking go for those. It was the incorrect call. Sacking there is always correct, but... I wanted to go deathless on this attempt, so... This was actually ridiculously unlucky too. If any of the four attract chances had prevented the Whirlipede from attacking, or if this thing's attack IV was even two or three, I'd be sitting pretty after this fight. You've made this game look pretty easy so far, you're thinking, I'm sure. How big a deal could losing one Pokemon be? Because this is a hardcore Nuzlocke, I'm only allowed to catch the first Pokemon I encounter in each location. This game has 98 total locations, so assuming I don't screw up any of my encounters and successfully catch them all, I only get 98 Pokemon for this entire run. With one down, I have 97 left. How many Pokemon do I still have to beat? 1,806. Yeah, sacrificing is insanely powerful in Pokemon thanks to the free switch it allows, but if I rely too much on it, especially early on, I'm going to run out of Pokemon fast. And that's what makes even some of the simpler trainer battles in this game stressful. Yes, I can always go back and heal after every fight, but I won't always be able to go back and grab another Pokemon out of my box. If I want any chance at a deep run, a vast majority of these early trainer battles are going to have to be deathless. With the Aqua Grunt out of the way, I finally get access to the game's first gym. The order of a few events from Emerald have been shifted in this game, and one of the most noticeable is the gym order. Brawly is the first gym leader you take on in Run and Bun, and his Dewfort gym includes a few nasty black belt trainers. The toughest is Christian, who has two terrifying guts Pokemon in Girder and Machoke to shut down any attempt to get through this gym with Will-O-Wisp spam. Thankfully, I have Quillfish, which has become one of the most valuable encounters with its Intimidate ability. It serves as the perfect pivot for this fight, and it allows me to get Execute in position to hit a critical hit Psybeam that makes this battle much easier than I expected. Before Brawly, I decided to use my first rare candy. You see, you don't have to grind in Pokemon Run and Bun, because at the start of the game you get an infinite candy key item. This infinite candy, however, only allows you to level up until you hit the highest level of the next boss's ace Pokemon. Once at that level cap, your Pokemon gains zero XP. However, this game also has rare candies spread throughout the game that you can obtain by fighting optional difficult trainer battles. These rare candies are intended to get Pokemon over the level cap. This allows for some very interesting strategic decisions, as there are a ton of Pokemon evolutions or moves intentionally placed one level behind a boss fight level cap. D4 
Do you use your rare candy to get an advantage on a gym fight, or do you save it for the next one? Do you fight an optional difficult trainer to obtain said rare candy? It's a very cool system. So for example, Choodle isn't quite powerful enough for this fight at level 21, but at level 22 it evolves into Dreadnought and gets much stronger, nearly doubling all of its base stats. That makes it a useful answer for Brawly's Law Bunny, which wants to hammer us with a massive normal type retaliate after we take down his lead legendary Kubfu. The Law Bunny is quite the demon as it's holding an eject button, so if you don't one-shot it, it will be swapped out and can blast you with a second boost at Retaliate later on in the fight. The evolved rock type though, absolutely tanks it, and now Quillfish gets to do its work. Quillfish could take down this Combuskin in two hits, but Combuskin can deal big damage back with Thunder Punch, and Quillfish's Intimidate is far too valuable to waste its HP here. Instead, I pivot through Execute, baiting a fire move into Primplup, which is able to take down with a classic Bubble Beam into Priority Aqua Jet combo to get around the speed boost. Unfortunately, because the incoming Hitmontop has Pursuit, I am trapped, and Primplup has to be sacrificed. It's a bad death, but it's looking like I'll make it through the rest of the fight, as Quillfish has a clean 2 at KO on the hit on top. Until... Well, that's a little bit unfortunate. Should I pivot to Dreadnought first? Oh yeah, true. Why didn't I do that? Well, punished. Actually pun- well, it, it's not punished, because I got double crit anyway, so it doesn't matter. It would have crit through the Intimidate. <laughs> I mean, that is, it is what it is, man. What are you going to do about that? I get punished for failing to play around the second crit. Remember that crits go through the attack drop from Intimidate, so this damage is just so massive compared to what I would have taken normally. Now I don't really have much of an option but to pray. Critical hits are increased from 1 in 24 to 1 in 16 in this game, by the way. So, here's hoping. I dodge the triple crit. Beedrill makes quick work of the Poliwhirl, and Mighty Anna's Covet makes it a hard counter for the final Pokemon, Scraggy. The double crit really hurts, as Quillfish has been a godlike encounter for me. But this is a really tricky fight, and I'm happy to get through with just two deaths, and three total for the rest of the run. Now it's finally time to head towards Roxanne, the typical first leader in Emerald. She has an absolutely ridiculous team, but before that, I have a bunch of trainers to take down. That includes the first double battle. There are 30 double battles throughout Run and Bun, and you better be up to date on double battle mechanics and strategies for these fights. This battle against twins Gia and Mia features a strategy so powerful it made day two of last year's VGC World Championships, friend guard Clefairy. Congrats to Enzo on the 89th place finish, by the way. The twins Clefairy only knows two moves, but they're the only ones it needs to be one of the best support Pokemon in doubles, Follow Me and Helping Hand. Clefairy may not be able to attack, but this is one of the best Pokemon in double battle history at keeping its partner alive. With its ability Friend Guard, it boosts its partner's defenses by 33%, and with Follow Me, it can force any single target attacks into itself rather than its partner. With its decent natural bulk and the Eviolite item, it can soak up hits while its partner spams its best attacking moves. Helping Hand not only only boosts its partner's attacks by 50%, but it also lets it be useful even when I try to block its follow me attempts with Fake Out. Deden, Abra, and Togedemaru might not sound like the scariest teammates, but this Clefairy still made me work for it. Just look at how much calculation this fight required just to get away deathless. Pretty soon after that, I arrive at Rustboro City, the home of Roxanne's gym. I immediately head out to grab my encounter. I totally intentionally led my static Flaffy to make sure I get the best encounter on this grass patch, Togedemaru. With the Iron Barb's ability, Fake Out, and U-Turn down the line, Togedemaru is one of the best pivot Pokemon in the entire game. As a Steel-type, it's also going to be incredibly useful for the Rock-type gym I'm going to take on. I desperately need another good Rock Resist. With Togedemaru in tow, I feel really confident in my encounters for this gym. I, we did a lot of planning, I feel not very confident at all. I have so many strong fighting types. Krogunk, Hariyama, and Breloom are all great options in this gym's rock types. The big problem is there is some incredible coverage in this gym, from the ice and thunder punches waiting around on many of the gym trainers, to the ridiculous diversity that is Roxanne's team. Brawly's Lopunny should have been a sign that while gym leaders will mostly carry Pokemon of the same type as their gym, not everything will match. Roxanne is carrying two non-rock types on her team, and they're both quite threatening. First, her lead Bisharp. At least this guy is weak to fighting, just like most of the rest of her team, but Bisharp makes sure you can't just sweep this gym with a solid steel type like the one I just picked up. So does her Zygarde 10%. Yeah, that's right. Roxanne got a Zydog. Thousand Arrows is one of the most broken moves in Pokemon, a ground type move that ignores flying type immunity and even smacks down flying types. It's not like flying types were going to be useful here, but it also serves as another great counter to the steel types that would otherwise destroy Roxanne's team. After those two, Roxanne finally unleashes the rocks. Aurorus with Refrigerate Body Slam to scare off grass types, Caracossa with Solid Rock and Brindo Berry to lift just about anything, and finally Lunatone and Soul Rock, both with Levitate. I look at this team and I'm pretty sure I 
have one primary job to do in this fight. Do not let Lunatone use Ancient Power. Ancient Power boosting Pokemon are scary enough on their own. Caracosta also carries Ancient Power here, but it's way scarier from Lunatone this time because of Ancient Power's ridiculous synergy with Stored Power. Stored Power has an initial base power of 20, but that power goes up by 20 for each boost a Pokemon has acquired. That means one Ancient Power Omni boost makes it six times as strong before even applying the special attack boosts. It's a one button sweep just waiting to happen. To make matters worse, Lunatone is holding a weakness policy, another way to boost its stored power, so I can hit it with a super effective attack unless it's going to kill. Here's the problem. I don't see any obvious way to consistently deny the ancient power while also ensuring I have a good counter to Zygarde. Hariyama pretty much just wins this fight without boosts. But if my time becoming the best Nuzlocker in the world has taught me anything, it's that in early game, you have to prepare for the worst case scenario even when it's a small chance. My planned outline immediately collapses thanks to a crit on Bisharp's first turn. Now the bait is completely different and the plan has to change on the fly. What the opponent sends out after it loses a Pokemon in this game is partly based on your Pokemon's HP. Instead of bringing out Aurorus after taking out the Bisharp, Roxanne is now going to bring out Zygarde to look for the kill with Dragon Claw. Now I have to completely change my plan on the fly. Okay, so here's the problem. Had he not crit, I would be baiting Aurorus after this and it would body slam and I could go Toga tomorrow and kill it. However, because he crit us, Breloom is now outsped and dead to Zygarde. I guess it's at least consistently Dragon Claw from Zygarde. This is also bad because we really needed Breloom's HP for Caracosta and stuff. Okay, no, we're only baiting Iron Head this turn. If we went Togedemaru, we would tank quite a bit of damage. I think I have to just take the kill and play the fight out. But what do I do on Zygarde Dragon Claw? I, I still go Mighty Anna, right? It's actually just better. Um, we just take the kill here. We should be faster uh, after in, after Paralysis. We just Mega Drain it, get one HP back. And then it should be Zygarde, it should be Dragon Claw. We go Mighty Anna and we see how does it... I think, I think this line is fine. I think there's no clever line I can do here. I think Togedemaru switch is just straight up worse. It just takes extra damage. It's the same exact line. I land on a Mighty Yana angle, relying on its Intimidates. Now I'm praying to dodge crits even harder than before, but it looks like the best way to get this fight back on track. Mighty Yana's Ice Fang gets through the Zydog and baits in her Aurorus. Togedemaru absolutely destroys Aurorus and the fight is basically back on track, even though I'd love a bit more HP on Breloom. Hariyama ends up being the ideal pivot on Soul Rock, baiting Psycho Cut is a way to get Mighty Yana in for Intimidates. Soul Rock's Stomping Tantrum adds an interesting wrinkle though, because if Psycho Cut fails due to the Dark Immunity, Stomping Tantrum doubles in power. Still, the Mighty Yana pivot allows Eggie to get in without taking too much damage, and makes flinching the rock slides less scary as well thanks to Intimidate. Togedemaru takes down Soul Rock, but I'm not out of the woods yet. Razor Shell from Caracosta sees four killing rolls on it, and it looks like I might have to sacrifice again. I'm forced to let it Ancient Power, no boosts, and it gets to try again after living a Mega Drain range from Breloom. Again, no boosts. Caracosta boosting wasn't the insta-loss I would have suffered to have the Lunatone boosted, but it was still a scary line nonetheless. And I still have to deal with Lunatone. Thankfully, it sees a kill with Icy Wind against Breloom, so I don't have to worry about it boosting on the first turn. But now, I have to play carefully. I managed to get a Force Palm Paralysis though, and with that, Togedemaru is able to get in and cleanly end the fight. This fight had so much going on that in the end, I'm not quite sure I actually found the optimal line. Beyond my dodging of the ancient power boosts, I was also lucky that Caracosta didn't hit Breloom with a Zen headbutt. But either way, it feels great to get out of this insane fight deathless. That was a fucking Zygarde I just had to take down in the second gym after all. And shout out to Togedemaru for landing three completely unnecessary Metal Claw crits. By the way, if you're wondering why this game is called Run and Bun, the game is named after a friend of the creator and fellow Nuzlocker, Runabun. For those boomers of you that, like me, have been in the Nintendo pocket of the internet for over a decade now, you might remember this being a naming trend for ROM hacks back in the Super Mario World modding days. Jesus Christ, that was long ago. I think most of you weren't even born back then. So far, my assessment of Run and Bun is that its early game is really similar to Emerald Kaizo in terms of difficulty. I haven't been going through this game blind, I've been using documentation that shows the upcoming teams and their moves, items, and abilities. And I know just by looking at these few splits that the difficulty of Run and Bun is about to ramp up significantly. On top of featuring powerful opponents, Run and Bun simply has more to get through. About a hundred more trainer battles than Emerald Kaizo, making every Pokemon that much more important to hold onto. Before Watson is the first of Run and Bun's added mini-boss fights against the new rival Shell, 
named after absolutely nobody, who is boasting an absurd team. Before I get there though, I have to deal with a bunch of trainer battles and every single one of these requires pretty serious planning if I want to get through without losing something that'll be important for the run going forward. Take this fight against battle girl Luna. This one shouldn't be too bad since I'm at level 32 and her Pokemon are level 28 or lower, but all of her Pokemon have diverse movesets, solid base stats, and different typings. It's a fight that requires a lot of switching and a frozen masquerade isn't helping anything. All of a sudden, this Graplocked is more threatening than it has any right to be. I go for some Intimidates and use Breloom as the pivot to fish for some effect support chances. All I have to do is weaken it enough to where I'm not risking Hariyama on the switch in, and... Oh wait, I just Vital Throw, right? And then Revenge doesn't get boosted. Yeah. Mm, not how it works, huh? Oops. I make it through without losing anything else, but this one hurts. I have other fighting types, but Hariyama is great and losing it was entirely unnecessary as I later realized. I could have brought Zatu for this fight and the Grappelocked would have been free. I totally was not fixated on this moment for the entire weekend after either. There is also another really difficult double battle to get through before the next boss. Anna and Meg have a team built around the crazy interactions that can happen with spread electric attacks like Discharge and abilities like Lightning Rod or Volt Absorb. If you aren't careful in this fight, the Amolga and Lantern can continuously power up and heal their partners all while while smacking both of your mons with powerful electric special attacks, all while threatening paralysis. Togedemaru proves why it's one of the best double battle mons in this fight. Its fake out allows Dreadnought to pick up the Rock Slide KO on the Amolga before it can discharge, and with that I'm in a pretty good position. Rock Slide picks up a double KO on the next turn, and the Lantern isn't ever able to put itself in a spot to actually threaten our team, because I have my own Lantern to wallet on to shell. Mini Boss honestly doesn't seem like the right word for the strong of a team. Not only does she have some tremendously bulky mons like Lapras, Rhydon, Togekiss, and Slowbro, she also has ridiculous hacks potential. The Lapras has Sing, the Togekiss has a Scope Lens and Super Luck, meaning I should pretty much be expecting crits, the Slowbro has a Quick Claw to go with its Quick Draw ability, meaning I can't count on revenge killing it. And if I can get through all that, waiting for me is an utterly terrifying Delcaddy. Yes, you heard that right. The Delcaddy only has two moves, and that's all part of the plan to decimate opposing trainers. First is Fake Out, simple enough, great move. The second is Last Resort. This is one of the best moves on paper at 140 base power and 100 accuracy, but it has one of the most restrictive conditions to use it in the whole game. A Pokemon can't use it until it's used every other move it knows. Gen 8 mechanics matter here too. Delcaddy's Normalize ability used to just turn non-normal type moves into normal type moves, making it a mostly useless ability. But since Gen 7, it has boosted normal moves by 20%. In combination with Normal Stab and Delcaddy Silk Scarf, that means Last Resort is going to hit. I get a great start against the Lapras as Lantern eats a pair of body presses and dodges a sing before taking it out. Unfortunately, my forgetfulness gets me here. I forgot to equip the hard stone to boost Dreadnought's damage, so Delcaddy is able to get a second last resort into Dreadnought. I can't just lean on Dreadnought anymore, but Ampharos gets a supremely clutch static paralysis on the Togekiss and gets things back on track. Breloom destroys the Rhydon thanks to its Giga Drain healing. Togedemaru completely walls her Vespiquen, dealing more damage back to Vespiquen through Iron Barbs than Vespiquen dealt to it with dual wing beat. It's all down to the Slowbro, and I'm looking like I can get through this fight deathless as long as I can go first. Quick Draw and Quick Claw means it's almost as likely to go first as it is not to, so I have no choice but to pray. Send headbutt, please. That's fine. Barring crits, we're gonna be okay. Okay. Barring crits, we're gonna be okay. Come on. Big dog. I think I might just be dead, actually, if he gets quick draw here. Well, nothing to do. Get fucking owned. Get fucking owned. You suck. You're shit. And just like that, we had beaten the hardest fight of the early game. But there was so much more to come, so much more to look forward to. Make sure to sub subscribe to the channel to see further adventures of me in this game. At the time of this recording, there have been only two confirmed Hardcore Nuzlocke victories of this game. It's a new game, sure, but lots of players who handled Emerald Kaizo have taken their shots at this game, and only two have finished. So yeah, I'm feeling pretty damn good about getting this far on my first attempt, with only four deaths. Perhaps most importantly, I can feel my hyperfixation on this game coming on strong. I'm invested now. I want to push this run as far as I can, and then I want to take this game and solve it, just like I did Emerald Kaizo. If you'd like to see me continue, subscribe to this channel and my second channel, Peach Daily, where we upload stream highlights on everything but a daily basis.